Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday episode. It is going to be another two-parter. So next Sunday, we'll have the part two of this. I've really enjoyed doing this lately. We did it with God and love. We did it with God and mental health, and we did it with Jesus and his New Testament commands. I'll have all of those linked in the description down below, but today we are doing God and his emotions. Now, next Sunday, we're going to cover how emotional this God is. Tons of examples and all the reasons that's problematic. Today, specifically, we're going to look at the fact that God is a God who bargains, who can be bartered with, who has haggles. This, I think, is a big problem for an omniscient and all-powerful God. So in terms of an outline, I want to first cover my two main theological issues with this concept. Then I want to show you the verses from the Bible that show God doing this. Always want to cite the verses for you guys. Then I want to talk about how modern Christians today still do this kind of a thing. And lastly, if I haven't gone too long, I think that we will cover how apologist or your typical Christian tries to excuse this behavior. So let's dive in. What is the first main problem with a God who is willing to bargain. And by the way, I should maybe give you an example first. There's all kinds of bargaining that happens. I mean, even the concept of having a sacrificial son is a bargaining of sorts. That's not so much what we're going to talk about. Also, all of the things that people have to do to be forgiven, whether it's Old or New Testament, this is another kind of weird bargaining system with God. I know it's not typically looked at that, but it is. It is a trade. Your devotion, your love, your submission, your acknowledgement of your sin for eternal life, salvation, God giving you his spirit, allowing himself to be around you, etc. So those are bigger and greater concepts, and we can definitely talk about those another time. I'm talking about specific times where God wanted to do something Hint, it was always terrible, like kill someone, destroy an entire people group, destroy his own people group, destroy one of his leaders, destroy the entire world, whichever examples you'd prefer. And then someone, typically a prophet, will intervene and they will remind God of his promises, of his long-term plan that he had shared with them, of his compassion. And the first most obvious problem with this is God's omniscience. What kind of a game is it? If God already knows what he's going to do, the conversations he's going to have, and then still act out this theater, if you will. Oh, I'm so angry. I'm definitely going to destroy them. God, no, remember your people. We're so little. We're so helpless. Okay, fine. I won't do it that way or this time. What is that? It's funny. I remember having these kinds of thoughts, even as a believer, when I would read these verses and you dismiss them and you excuse them so easily, which again, we'll get to at the end of this video. But the stark contrast between a perfect, all-knowing, all-loving God with a God that repeatedly, because of jealousy or his hot temper, decides he wants to kill someone or something or everyone or everything, and then can be dissuaded or talked down or bargained with, is truly insane to me. These are concepts that should be mutually exclusive. One thing that I want to state in terms of that is that most of these examples, if not all, are going to be coming from the Old Testament. Again, bartering in a bigger sense happens in the New Testament, but these specific examples I've been talking about are all Old Testament. And back then, there wasn't this concept of a God that was everywhere all at once, a God that knew absolutely everything. Maybe an all-powerful God, but some of these other omnis definitely came later. So within its time and place, it makes sense that these particular writers thought that they had a God that they could kind of deal with. After all, the very nature of this relationship is a covenant. Do this and get that. Here's my promise to you. Here's your promise to me. That's a negotiation. It's also insane to think that the creator of the universe picked out one itsy bitsy teeny little tribe that started with one family and said, with you and with you alone, will I make a deal? But that's their story and they're sticking to it. So this negotiation with God is okay for the Old Testament. But if you're a believer today and you still believe that God is immutable and that the Old Testament still represents the same God and that, in fact, that was even Jesus and the Holy Spirit still in the presence and acting as one with that God when all of this was happening, you simply cannot justify this. You cannot reconcile this. A God who acts like he's going to do one thing and then because of a conversation with a mortal does another is good storytelling, but it's horrific theology. God's human parts are showing again here, and I just think that we need to come to terms with it. I want to point out as many inconsistencies as possible with this channel. And this is one that, again, I haven't heard, I don't think anyone ever talk about, although I'm sure so many people have thought it as they read the Bible in a year and they finally read the Old Testament for the first time. And they're like, what 
is this? And again, I think some of these verses will surprise many of you who have never taken the time to do so. So again, there's not like a whole lot to be said there. That's issue one. Issue two, I think, might even be a little bit stranger. If God in his perfect wrath, in his perfect justice, has decided that a certain punishment is necessary, isn't bargaining with God, getting God to not do God's will and to actually avoid his divine plan or what is required, right? Like, let me try to set this up. The Christian, the apologist, the preacher, the teacher, the devotional, it constantly tries to put this in, hey, we're here, we showed up, and this is the setting. There's a fall, there's an enemy, there's a perfect God who loves you, who wants you. He wants you to be saved, but he's given you free will, but he's also a righteous God. And so whether you're talking about death or hell or these Old Testament curses or a people group being destroyed or the excuses for the genocide that happens in the Old Testament, we are told that it is because God is perfect and righteous and he has to do these things. His glory demands it. Or does it? If he can be talked out of it, if he can relent, then he doesn't have to. And if he didn't have to in these examples that I'm going to show you in a minute, then did he ever have to? And this, I think, is the most damning part of this entire thing. The consistency goes out the window as soon as a mere mortal human can remind God of something as if he's forgotten, can play on God's heartstrings as if God is so emotionally swaying and changing. And again, the emotion we're going to cover in next Sunday's video. But this is hands down, if you're being honest with yourself, not what you would expect of a perfect God. And the very fact that sometimes he can do otherwise means that every other time he says his hands are tied, it's not true. Hopefully I can explain it better as we go through some details. So let's crack open the old Bible and let's start giving you some examples and maybe this will help again, really drive the point home. We're going to start in Genesis. And some of these stories will be more familiar than others, but that's fine. We'll do Genesis 18, 22. This is where Abraham intercedes for Sodom. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked? Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And this goes on, by the way. This particular example goes from fifty men down to less, down to less, until, hey, you know, it's really just not that many people. I'm going to have to destroy it, but I'll make another bargain with you and I'll let your special relative and his family get out. But I'll make an insane deal there too that she can't look back and then she does and I'll kill her. Like, <laughs> it's all so ridiculous. Ridiculous. But the context before this verse is that God is so fed up with the sins of these people that it's just time to destroy them. Oh, what an interesting thing. It's interesting this didn't happen way more. And it's also interesting that this has never happened since. I guarantee you whatever was going on in Sodom is not anything that's not happening in every major metropolis today, period. Just another bit of God's inconsistency there. But Abraham, who draws near to God, is already in God's presence and then comes closer and is like, God, I thought you were just. Just gods don't kill righteous people because of the sins of some of the other. Even Abraham understood collective punishment was ridiculous. And even though God is willing to negotiate here, it still ultimately doesn't go well. And so he destroys the cities anyways, and he goes on to still forget Abraham's negotiation, and he collectively punishes for the rest of time. Now, Let's just pretend this is all a true story. What if, for whatever reason, Abraham didn't say anything to God? God just immediately destroys the city in his vengeance. And assuming since God spares Lot that Lot is righteous, that would mean that without Abraham's conversation and intervening, God destroys this innocent family. So God, left to his own devices, would have immediately committed evil. And the fact that this God is claimed omniscient means that God would have known this. So it's thanks to Abraham that God didn't commit this obvious crime, again, according to his own standard. We have it right here that Abraham says it is not 
just to kill the righteous with the wicked. And God obviously agrees with that. Thus why he extends the barter. So if we have this as a standard that has now been set, that this kind of collective punishment is indeed not just, then every example that comes after this, including the hypothetical, if Abraham had not intervened, shows that God is not just. Honestly, I think it's that simple. I think we just cracked the code. I think this is the perfect example. And the reason I'm taking so much time with this first verse, we get an admittance essentially from God in his willingness to deal with Abraham based off this logic that collective punishment is wrong. And we will get countless examples throughout the rest of this book of God doing just that, of God being then unjust. Case closed. That's it. I mean, we'll keep going, but Seriously, it's absolutely so very telling. Okay, so the next example requires a bit of context. Back in Exodus 33, we have the golden calf incident had just happened, and God is telling the people, go, but I'm not going to go with you, lest, here's what he says, but I will not go among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Now, this is a huge deal. I mean, it says even here in verse 4, when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments, for the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you are stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go among you, I would consume you. And this is not the good kind of consuming. <laughs> Do you guys remember that DC Talk song, you consume me, moving through me, anytime, any place, something with your face? I don't know. Man, I used to love my DC Talk. Okay, but we're going to skip forward to verse 11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Remember that. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, I have found favor in your sight. Please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. He has to remind God of this constantly, by the way. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, is it not you going with us so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. Stopping here just to point out the insanity of the favoritism. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing you have spoken, I will do for you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Now that's really where it ends, but I just want to point this out really quick. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. You cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. I'm sorry, what happened eight verses earlier? Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Hmm. Okay. But anyways, that's not really the point there. So again, we see, you know, we have this huge issue. God is going to say, you can still go to the land of milk and honey. I'll even send an angel before you but I'm not going to come with you. If I came with you, my anger, I would just consume you immediately. And then Moses said, I thought we had favor. I thought I was a good guy and your people remember your people. And so we get this and it's hilarious because I actually opened up to the wrong verse and it happened to be another time when Moses was interceding for the people. But this was one chapter too late. It's actually what I wanted to read to you was from chapter 32. So you can read it for yourself. But starting in verse seven, we have God telling Moses who was up on the mountain doing the whole Ten Commandment thing. You know what your people did and saying, I'm going to destroy them. And then in verse 11, we get this. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, oh, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains, to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from the disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars in heaven and all the land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken on bringing on his people. So, a couple things here. I know it's a little redundant from what we read in 33, though I think that it's necessary to point these both out. And it was a happy accident. But the thing that I love in a lot of these examples that we're going to go through is the different ways in which these prophets appeal to this God. And the particular tactic that Moses is using here is saying, this is going to look really bad on you. And there's some greater context here. Like when the 10 plagues were going on, that was God telling Moses like, Hey, I'm going to do this to show my power and watch what's going to happen. Egypt is going to turn towards me, which 
also never happened, by the way. But Moses is kind of, I think, pulling back on that string. Like, how is it going to look to Egypt now if you took all these people just to kill them? That's not going to bode well for you. Don't you want to be recognized everywhere? He's playing on God's ego. In a similar fashion, how Abraham had to remind God of God's character. I hope that you guys are enjoying this as much as I'm enjoying talking about it because I find this concept absolutely fascinating. Let's move on to another example though. And this little story is found in Judges 6.36. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I'm laying out a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. A little bit different. First of all, we still have him playing on God's emotions like, you know, you said you want me to deliver your people, like your people, like I'm reminding you this is still really for your benefit, God, but I'm a little nervous. I'm not sure if I'm the guy. Could you make me feel better about this? And he puts this kind of deal before God, this test, truly testing God to see if what he thinks he's hearing is actually what God is saying. And God performs the test, not just once, but then Gideon reverses it to make absolute sure, and God is still willing to do it. And I love this verse for a few reasons. One, all of the ridiculous things about God is not a God that should be tested. When the doubter says like, God, why don't you show up? I want to really know if what I'm hearing in my head is you. I want to really know if this is your word. People crying out in absolute abject desperation, looking for a sign because this God hides from his people. And it's hilarious too, because people look on the store and they're like, look, what a good God. He's just reassuring his, you know, fallible human Gideon. Before the commanded massacre that Gideon is going to go do to make way, by the way, for that same promise that Moses was just negotiating back in Exodus 32, that this land will be theirs and their offsprings forever. Well, that land wasn't empty. They have to kill a whole bunch of different people on the way, and this is just part of it. So a little off topic, kind of fits, worth bringing up, I think. Let's do some more. Let's go to a more positive one, if you can say that. This is going to come to us from 2 Kings, and it's going to be about Hezekiah. This is in 2 Kings 20. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die. You shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, now, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up out of the house of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you from this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, a God of omniscience knows when Hezekiah is going to die. He knows that this prayer is going to happen and that he's going to change his mind. So when he first said Hezekiah was going to die soon, was that a lie? Or had God somehow put off his own omniscience not to know the prayer was coming? The prayer catches him off guard. He is reminded of his goodness and he changes his mind and now he creates something new. It can't all work like this. This is the problem with prayer in general. See my prayer video. I mean, there is so many issues going on. You can't be omniscient and then be moved by a prayer. And if you can, then this should remain true now. But we're told all the time that when God says no, or maybe, or wait, or any of the excuses for people not getting their prayers answered, it's because God has a plan. Sure. Well, can't we change his plan? Isn't that what we're learning from these stories? That if we pray hard enough, if we're sincere enough, if we've been righteous enough, we can get God to do that which he otherwise would not have done? Issues, 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 issues. There's like a hundred times that this happens with Moses. I'm going to read you one more just because I think that it's only fair to show a little more with Moses since it happens so much in the early days. But let's go to Numbers this time. And this is in Numbers 14, starting at verse 13. Then the Egyptians will hear of it, for 
you brought up this people in your might from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land, they have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people, for you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say, is it because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give them? So I know this is redundant, but there's a few things here that are interesting. It's not just Egypt. It's now all the peoples of the world that God has to impress, that we don't want to make a liar out of God. God has specifically said that certain things will happen. And if you kill these people now as one, again, Moses joining Abraham is talking about the unjust nature of collective punishment. Then how will this look for you? But let's move on. Let's go back to Judges. And we're going to talk about Samson now. And this story comes in Judges 16 towards the end. I believe it's verse 28. Yes. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me even this once. O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom killed at the death were far more than those whom he had killed during his life. I point this one out. I know it's quick. I know it's a different kind of bargaining, but God had obviously given Samson a gift. And then when Samson didn't honor his commitment to receive that gift, which was not having his hair cut, he took the gift away from him. And now Samson wants this gift once more. So we see God giving him this gift to do what and for why? To destroy the enemies and get vengeance. What I think the pattern that's developing is with Gideon and Samson getting to kill other people and Moses and Abraham getting God not to kill their people is that the only time God is willing to change his mind, be negotiated with, be bargained with, is to still come about by his very own will. For his chosen people to be alive and inherit the land, and for everyone else, all the enemies of the earth, to be destroyed. That is what is happening in every single one of these cases thus far. I want to get into some of the prophets other than Moses and Abraham and talk about some of these examples. So let's just go to Amos, where we just covered on Thursday. If you haven't seen the Secular Bible Study series on Amos yet, please go check it out. This comes from Amos 7. I said, O Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. And the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. But this goes on and on and on. And then he relents a few times, but then he just doesn't. He does like the third one or the fourth one. I forget exactly what. But again, here we have a prophet, Amos, reminding God, or just look at us, Jacob, we're small. Like, what did you expect? Come on, do better, forgive. God's like, okay, I won't do that. I won't do that. And then he still just does this horrific thing. If you want to know what, go check out Amos. All right, let's go to Ezekiel 9. So this one in Ezekiel is kind of long. So we're going to bounce around so I can give you all the context. At the end of 8, this is after the abominations in the temple because of the idol worship that has been happening. Here is what God is saying. Therefore, I will act in wrath. My eyes will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Okay, so we have this, and then we have Ezekiel, and he starts bartering with them, and this allows God to say, okay, fine, listen, I'm still going to kill a ton of women and children. You can read this for yourself. I'm still going to kill all of these people. There's a few who are righteous. I'll put a mark on them, and that way this mysterious figure who's going through these six executioners know who not to kill, but it's starting to get away from God, and so this is what Ezekiel says afterwards. I fell upon my face and cried, ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? And he said to me, the guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. As for me, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. So this time I wanted to bring this up. We have a failed interceding. All of these people needed to die. All of these idol worshipers. Tell me how young children can be idol worshipers. Actually, I think it's in this book, if not Hosea, where God tells us why he can judge these children this way. The parents will often send the children to go collect food from the fields that they then give as sacrifices to these false gods. And thus, they're guilty. Yet we have a commandment on these very children that they need to honor and obey their mother and father or else be stoned to death. So it sounds to me like these children were put in an impossible situation. How utterly disgusting. And I want to end with one of my favorite, if you can call it that, verses in the Bible. It is astonishing to me how ridiculous ridiculous this is and the excuses that I've heard get made for this. And this is the story of the time that God wanted for seemingly no reason at all 
to destroy Moses himself. This is really short. It happens in Exodus chapter four. The context is, you know, Moses is given a sign that he's going to go do these things. And he says, but I'm not a good speaker. And God takes pity on him and says, okay, I'll give you your brother Aaron. He's good at speaking, right? And Moses is like, okay, can I go see my family back in Egypt? And God's like, yes, but make sure you do these plagues. I'm going to harden their hearts because I want to show my glory. And Moses is like, okay, got it. And so he goes on his trip back to Egypt and out of Nowhere, verse 24, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to put him to death. Then Zephora, who's Moses' wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. And then it just moves on like nothing happened. Verse 27 is the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. Like, <laughs> What? God was going to kill Moses? How would any of this happen? What was his plan? But what I want to say, the whole point of me bringing up this verse is it is yet again another example of God being willing to negotiate. You know you have an ancient messed up God when the only way to avoid him killing the greatest prophet ever is by genital mutilation of his son and the bloodied flesh of that penis touching the bare skin of Moses' feet. Blood Blood magic, superstition, torture, mutilation to appease and bargain with this perfect, all loving, all knowing God. Now, those examples took longer than I thought. And there's so many more guys. There are so many more. And we could talk about some of the New Testament ones. I mean, we even have Jesus trying in the garden to bargain with God. Like, is there any other way? Do I have to go do this horrible thing? which that's problematic for about a thousand reasons. Praying to himself to let himself out of the deal that he sent himself to commit. Like, what? But I digress. Let's talk about the excuses. Many apologists, many people, Christians, believers, etc., that are trying to explain this do so by making this a plus in God's column. Well, look, we have a righteous God and we have sin that demands a consequence, but we also have a gracious God. And what all of these stories show us is that he's willing to recognize and honor the individuals who will love, obey, and serve him. Which, by the way, is just a nice way of saying, if you don't want this God to kill you, completely be submissive to him. Not as pretty when you say it that way, is it? But the other thing that completely breaks down this entire line of argumentation is the chosen people group thing. The only time where the bargaining is beneficial to someone's life is if you're in the in-group. But in the other examples that I gave you, and there's many more than just the ones I gave you of Gideon and Samson in Judges, is that if you're part of the out-group, someone can actually bargain with God to have you destroyed. I think that's the best counter-argument to that that there is. And even if it held up, which it doesn't, it wouldn't explain the conundrum with God's omniscience. Is God play-acting? Are we so little and lowly that even though God knows what... It's like, it's like that scene from The Matrix... <laughs> in the first one where the oracle says, what does she say? Don't worry about the cookies. And because she said that, Neo bumps the cookies, causing them to fall. They wouldn't have fallen if she hadn't said, don't worry about them. Is God saying, I'm going to do this just to get the prophets to react like, no, God, don't remember who you are. So God can relent and look like he answers prayers. Is it just me? Or can you see how absolutely empty and ridiculous ridiculous that would be. If God has time to play these kinds of games, to know that something's going to happen regardless, but concoct and construct and contrive these situations and negotiations, but won't answer straight up prayers for the millions of children that are starving to death each year, the millions that are still in slavery, the millions that are molested, the millions that are tortured, the millions that are killed, the diseases that are preventable, the famines that he allows. I mean, what this shows is just the clear man-made nature of these stories. It was important to them. This is what was going on in their little part of the world at this particular time. This was the God that they had claimed to serve. And so when good things happened or bad things happened, it was them and their negotiating with God. So they could try to get some power back. They could get an element of control. Well, if in the story God can be reasoned with, that gives hope, right? Never for the other people. Again, only for us, the in-group. Like it's just so clear. There's no good excuse for this. But that's the main one. Other excuses would be that these stories are are metaphorical in general. So this isn't a literal truth, which makes it perfect that God doesn't actually have to be contradictory in nature by doing these things, having these negotiations, changing his mind. I mean, the very fact, if you just said, I have an all perfect God with foreknowledge who changes his mind, that's like an oxymoronic statement right there. But by making everything 
this big imagery, symbolism, metaphor kind of a deal. You rob God of that. And so it's more about the moral lesson we're supposed to glean from it, which again, the moral lesson here is grotesque, if there even is one. And B, we absolutely have to believe that these characters, these figures, these happenings were literal or the whole thing breaks down. It's just very, very obvious. It's a very bad argument. Here's what we'll end with. How do people do this today? I'll share a personal story first and then kind of just say what is definitely out there in the ether. I read that story of Gideon when I was very young and I went through, like all people, different seasons of doubt and my level of conviction in this faith, etc. And I probably said a prayer that was similar to this at least once. 1,000 times begging God for any sign. I just wanted to know that he was real. And then I would do whatever. I would completely serve. I would never question. I just wanted one iota of evidence. And so taking the example, which is what we're supposed to do, and God is obviously a God who is willing to negotiate, who is willing to be bargained with. And so I pleaded, I did just this. It's good enough for the greatest men who already had God walking around. Like (laughs) Moses is in the tent of meeting as God rages in a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire, completely evidence of his presence right after he split an entire sea, right after he gave Moses the 10 commandments and his presence presence shone brightly on Moses' face, still Moses begs to see God, and God negotiates some kind of evidence with him as he passes by with his back to him, all of that. But little old Brandon, who has none of that, who gets absolutely crickets in terms of the evidence for a physical representation of this God, I can't make the same bargain. So I think that that is a huge issue. And yes, how many times I heard stories of Christians who had some addiction and they said, you know what, if, if God just helps me this once, if he does this one thing for me, I'll turn my life around. No more drugs, no more porn, no more sleeping around, no more alcohol, whatever it was. Here's an example that gets thrown around in probably every single church in all of America, if not the entire world. Someone is sick and someone cries out to God, I'll do this. I'll go into full-time ministry. I'll quit this sin. I'll, I'll, I'll reconnect with my father. Whatever you need, just heal my son, heal my sister, heal my father, whatever the case is. Bargaining with God. And by the way, I don't blame people in absolute desperation of trying to reach out, especially if they're already someone in the faith and doing whatever they can think to do to get God back on their side, because that is how this God is represented throughout all of scripture, Old and New Testament. If something bad is happening, it's typically to wake you up, to get your attention as a consequence or punishment of your sin. So obviously, if you stop sinning or you can make a promise to God about what you will do positively for him, maybe he'll relent. David did this himself with his son that God was killing slowly over the course of a week to punish him for his affair with Bathsheba. He fasted, he prayed, he got in his sackcloth, he put on his ash. These were the things that he did to try to bargain with God. Even fasting today, I see a video at least like once every couple days on YouTube about some pastor or preacher saying why we should fast and how it gets God's attention, how our prayers become mightier. That's a negotiation. That's bargaining. That's all do this and then God will do more. Again, prayer itself is a negotiation with the omniscient God of all creation who has already ordered everything, who already knows everything that will happen to adjust his plans for you because you're running late or you need the better parking spot or your kid is sick or whatever. Many of us know at least one or some of these examples, and we have conceptualized God as a God who will interact in the world. If only we do things right, if we come before him correctly, if we pray or fast, if we clean up our game, if we forgive others. I mean, even that's conditional. It's a negotiation. If we want to be forgiven, we have to forgive others. All of this is one huge contract with the creator of the universe, with a holy and mighty and perfect God. I hope that I've been able to just let you see a little more clearly the ridiculousness of this religion. I could go on and on, but I think I'll stop here. So thank you for your attention today. Thanks for bearing with me. I hope this was interesting. If you liked this at all, I can promise you'll love next Sundays where we talk about all of the different times that we see God displaying emotion, confusion, surprise, quick anger, etc. throughout the Bible, both old and New Testament. So until then, keep thinking. I'd like to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Martin, Sparky, Stephanie, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine patrons. Thanks and have a great day.